Ephesians chapter number 5, we began this chapter uh, two weeks ago, and we began by looking the first seven verses at what the believer's walk looks like. There are characteristics in the first seven verses that tell us what the believer's walk looks like. If you're with us, you'll remember that first of all, the believer's walk should be a walk of godliness. It says, be ye therefore followers of me. Literally means an imitator of God. It says we ought to walk in love as Christ hath loved, uh, hath loved us. And so it ought to be a walk of godliness and a walk of Christ-likeness. And then we saw it must be a walk of holiness. Verses 3 through 7 cover that up. So we saw what? And then last week we see why. We ought to walk as children of light, it says. The command was, was walk in the light and the characteristics we saw in, in verse 9. And then, uh, then we saw the commission reprove the darkness, expose it. We saw the call was come to the light. So we've seen what the believer's walk should look like. We've seen why the believers should walk that way. This morning and next week, we then cover how. How should that walk? How should we walk? How should we walk in godliness and Christ-likeness and holiness? How should we walk in the light? Notice if you would, verse number 15 of Ephesians 5. The Bible says, See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Yeah. These three verses that we'll cover the next two weeks deal with this subject of walking in wisdom. How should the believer walk as Christ in a, in a walk of godliness and a walk of holiness and walking in the light? They should walk in wisdom. We're going to see that this morning as we begin. Let's bow for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, it's been a wonderful time singing your praise this morning. The blessed assurance that Jesus is mine. The fact that we can follow you anywhere. That we have a flag to follow, finding it all in Jesus. We're grateful that there's never a time that you've not been faithful. Thank you for all these truths. But now as we open the book of truth, and now as we open your word, please open our hearts. May we focus on what you have, determined to agree and act upon what you've shown us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thus far in chapter 5, we've been given some rather large goals to accomplish. Would you agree with that? In our Christian lives, we've been told to be an imitator of God. I hear that and I think, that's a big goal. I mean, we're supposed to walk in love like Christ. I mean, we're not setting our sights low. We're setting that bar high, aren't we? We're supposed to walk as children of light. Wonderful things to set our sights on to glorify God with our lives. And yet here's the problem. Far too many Christians then begin to set out in this spiritual wilderness. Here we go. I'm going to be like God. I'm going to be like Christ. And because God's on my side, it's all going to end up okay. I hear people tell me that all the time. God's on my side. You know, I'd be worried. If I was always focused on God being on my side. Because the truth of the matter is he never changes, but I do. I'd much rather be on his side than him be on my side. Okay? And, and folks say this, you know, I just need to have faith. And he'll bless my plans and it'll all be okay in the long run. That sounds good. But let me tell you, that's a, a, an immature and a dangerous way for a Christian to live. What? Aren't we supposed to have faith, Pastor? Yes. Isn't it all going to be okay if God's on our side? Well, I guess in some way. But let me tell you this. It's rare for a Christian to actually stop and consider how he's going to walk. Yeah. Oh, I may have the same goals, but it's rare for a Christian to stop and consider what the cost is going to be. And if this is going to be the cost, I need to prepare and plan because I want to be in it for the long haul. You know what we have? We got a lot of Christians that the Bible says fall by the wayside because they set out, oh, I got faith, it's all going to be okay, and then the moment it's not okay, we give up on it all. Yeah. Well, I thought everything would be fine, it must not be in it, it must not be right, this and that, it, life's hard. Oh, it, how about 
we just figure out how we're going to walk. So when those times come, we know how to face it. And that's what Paul is, is showing us here. And he's telling this church at Ephesus, he's saying, look, I've given you some lofty goals and ambitions, but now let me tell you how to accomplish that. And so we get insight on it ourselves. I think we all agree we want to walk in godliness and Christ likeness and holiness. So how should we do that? He tells us in these verses it must be a walk in wisdom. We're only going to cover two of these short verses. I think we've made some headway covering 14 verses the last two weeks, but we're slowing down now. All right, we're getting some, some short verses. We'll spend some time on them. Walking in wisdom. I believe verse number 15 first gives us the description of this way. A walk in wisdom, hear me, is serious about life. Serious about life. The Bible says in verse 15, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Let's break down each of these words briefly as we begin this, the, the, this verse. It begins with the words, see then. Which are in effect kind of like therefore and wherefore. See then is saying because of what we've talked about. Because you and I must have a walk of godliness. Because we must have a walk of Christ-likeness. Because we must walk in a holy manner. Because of that, see then that you walk, and then here's the word, circumspectly. Circumspectly. What in the world does that mean? You don't hear that one very often. Many of you perhaps can even figure it out just based on the, the letters that are used. Circumspectly means carefully. Precisely. Diligently. In fact, it's the same word that's used in Matthew 2, 8. And in Matthew 2, the wise men have come to Jerusalem. They go before Herod looking for Jesus. And do you remember what he tells them? He says in verse number 8, go and search, and here's the word, diligently for the young child. How do you think he was telling the wise men to go look for Jesus in Bethlehem? Oh, just kind of carefree, go walk in the streets, see if you can figure it out. No, that's not what he was saying. Go search diligently, circumspectly. That means uncover everywhere. Go in every house. Search this way. Make sure you do your due diligence. It's the same word, circumspectly, that we saw a month ago, if you're with us on Sunday nights or Journey with Jesus in Luke 1, in verse number 3. Luke is describing his detailed work that he put together in, 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 in putting together the, the events of the life of Jesus. And he says, I've done this work diligently, it's my detailed work, and he says this, perfect understanding. That's the same word that we're getting circumspectly. What's he saying? I mean, careful. He's a doctor. He's a physician. He's doing his due diligence to uncover each detail. And that's the way the Bible tells us that we're supposed to walk. See then that you walk circumspectly. What does this mean? That means I'm not just going to go merrily on my way in the Christian life and everything's going to be peachy clean. It's all going to be wonderful. Hunky-dory. I heard that this morning for the first time since my mom said that 20 years ago. But uh, hunky-dory. I don't understand what hunky-dory means. Yeah, okay, you got it. You're figuring it all. It means I'm not just going to live my life. Ah, oh, everything. I'm carefree. God's on my side. It's all going to be okay. No, no, no. See then that you walk circumspectly. That means I'm going to watch on all sides. That means I'm going to be careful. I'm going to be studious. Now, hold on. That doesn't mean the way we would walk in a back alley. In a back alley, we're careful, but we're paranoid, right? We're scared. Like, what's going to happen? I might die. That's not that... Well, we still have the, the victory that, that Christ is greater. And so, but we're walking carefully and understanding this. As I walk each step, this world's not my home. Too many Christians are walking carefree, watch this, and far too comfortable in this world. If you're comfortable in this world today, may I tell you, we're not walking circumspectly. We ought not to be comfortable. We ought to be watching and seeing each step and is this wise and am I proving what's acceptable unto the Lord with this step? I'm walking circumspectly. My children illustrated this for me without even knowing it this week. I, we're out of town. I took them to a, a laser maze. Everybody who's been to a laser maze before, you enjoy that? You go into a small room and you got to hit the button on the other side, but there's lasers everywhere. Oh, and so you got to step over this one and around this one 
And my daughter's favorite, you got to get down on your belly and crawl under this one. She'd be crawling halfway across the room. And then you hit that button and now new lasers. And now you got to go this way. What are they doing? They're, they're being careful with every step. Christian, how's our walk this morning? Is it circumspectly? See them that you walk circumspectly and then it gives us a way not to walk. It says the next three words in verse 15, not as fools. So we're told how, circumspectly, and then we're told how not. Not as fools. When I think of the word fool in the Bible, my mind goes to Psalm 14, verse number 1, where the Bible says, The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. You know, there, there are a lot of self-acclaimed atheists today, but I'm convinced more than ever that most people aren't really atheists. They don't really not believe in a God. I'm convinced most people are just mad at God and don't want to believe in Him. God didn't do things the way they wanted. They thought He should, so He must not be real and this and that. And so, But I'm not here to talk about them. I'm not here to preach to folks that are outside these walls. This book is written to the church and to Christians. And you know what I'm convinced today? That far too many Christians may not be practicing atheists. Watch this, but they are practical atheists. That's right. So what do you mean? Oh, do you believe in God? Sure. Yeah, I love God. You believe in the Bible? Yeah, for sure. Then why isn't he in control of your life? I'll tell you why. Because we're practical atheists. We may love God and say, but, but as soon as what he says goes up against my life and I've got a choice to make, I'm going to pretend there's no God because uh, I'm in charge. <clears throat> And the Bible describes that as a, as a fool. Yeah. We're supposed to walk circumspectly, not as fools. We could spend all morning looking at what the Bible says of the disbelief of a fool and the disobedience of a fool. First Timothy uh, chapter 5 and 6 tells us a lot about the desires of a fool. The desires for reaching greater heights and, and, and money and career and fame and all. They're seeking after these things and it's foolish. The Bible tells us much about the distraction of a fool. You know the problem with fools in today's uh, world is that they're loud. Yep. Uh -huh. That's right. The Bible says a fool uttereth all his mind. And they don't keep it to themselves. We hear a lot of foolish things in this world and because it's so loud, sometimes we think it's the way to go. It's the distraction of a fool. We see the destruction of a fool in Scripture, the end of these individuals. And we're not going to spend all the time just studying a fool, but we are looking at the fact this morning that a walk in wisdom is serious about life. It's not foolish. It's understanding that God's in control. You know what Satan desires this morning? is to infect your heart with sin. We're looking at this in our teen class on Thursday night. We call our heart... When the Bible often speaks of the heart, especially in Proverbs, uh, our teenager, we're looking at it, and, and the heart is your, your thinker, chooser, feeler. That, that helps us understand what the heart is. It's the thinker. It's how we think. It's the chooser. It's our will, which way we're going to go. And it's the feeler, our emotions. So when the Bible says to keep your heart with all diligence, he's talking about your thoughts, your mind, your emotions. Why? Because out of it are the issues of life. It's important that we give God our hearts, but Satan wants to infect your heart with something small. A little sin here. If you know anything about an infection, physically, you get a little infection in your finger, it may not be a big deal at first. But if it's not taken care of properly, what happens? It spreads. And what happens? It calls, causes a whole lot of pain. And sometimes it destroys where it's at. It's no, it's no accident now that Satan is trying to infect your heart, and my heart, with sin. Because if it's not taken care of, if it's not confessed and forsaken, what's going to happen is it's going to spread. And something that seems so small and insignificant now is completely taking over our life and causing utter destruction everywhere it goes. Well, we're commanded in this passage not to walk in darkness anymore. And so when, the, when we shine the light of God's word and, and what he says on the darkness in our hearts, we've got a choice now. Are we going to fix it? Are we going to let the Lord fix it? Are we going to confess and forsake it and say, I can't walk that way anymore? Or are we going to allow Satan to spread that infection a little more? That would be walking as fools. 
When we don't walk circumspectly, when we walk as fools, hear this, we fail to see that there's a spiritual world around us that's more real than the world we see. May I just say it that way, please listen? The world we see, we all believe in, is not nearly as real as the spiritual world that we're in, Christian. That's why the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in high places, the rulers of the darkness of this world. We, we, we wrestle against principalities and power, all these things. Why? Because as a Christian, there's a spiritual battle. That's why we must put on the armor of God. That's why these things that we think are so innocent are no big deal. The devil wants to use to infect your heart. We've got to be wise. Walking circumspectly, not as fools. If I'm going to walk in wisdom, I'm going to walk carefully with each step. I'm going to do what verse 10 says and prove what's acceptable unto the Lord. I'm going to have characteristics of, of a righteous walk going forward. So we walk circumspectly, not as fools. And then it ends with these three words, but as wise. A wise walk. So that begs the question, okay, well, what is wisdom? Is wisdom knowledge? Well, knowledge is good, but that's not wisdom. Is wisdom then an application of that knowledge? I hear that a lot. It's taking what you know and it's doing something about it. Well, that would be man's wisdom. That's a good thing to have. Is wisdom experience? You know, been there, done that, learned my lesson. It's a good thing to have, but none of that is true Biblical wisdom. Okay, so what is? What, what is biblical wisdom? By the way, those things are good. It's good to have knowledge. It's good to apply that. It's good to be, have experience, but none of that is what the Bible tells us to get when it says that wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. When it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, what is this wisdom? Uh, I believe we can learn a lot from this book of Ephesians on what wisdom is. And may I break it down for you in this way? Here's wisdom. Wisdom's understanding who rules the world. Wisdom's understanding then what the world is like. Understanding where the world is headed. And living accordingly. What do you mean? Just here in this book, in chapter 1, we've seen that Christ is risen and that he reigns over all. Also in chapter 1, we see that he will bring all things under the headship of Christ. We saw in chapter 3 that he's chosen and will use his church as the vehicle to get the gospel to the world. We've seen that he's not finished with this plan yet. So hold on. He's in charge. He rules. He uses his church. He's not finished. Am I living accordingly? Because if I can forsake his church... I don't really desire to walk in wisdom. Yeah, that's good. Okay, let's go a step further. Chapter 4, a wise person understands that we live in a lost and fallen sinful world. That the world will follow the vanity of their mind. And it leads to utter corruption and destruction. Okay, oh, a wise person then will not follow the world's wisdom and live for the moment. We saw that in chapter 5, verses 3 through 7, living for now and for my pleasures. No, a wise person is not going to live that way. He's going to live holy and righteously. Why? Because he understands, a wise person understands God rules. God is in charge. A wise person understands this world is headed to hell and not getting better each moment. A wise person understands then that I've got to live by God's standard and not my own. I've got to live by what God says and not what the world is shouting at me. That's walking in wisdom. And if that's true, then I need to find out what his truth is and live by it. Amen. What is that? It's walking in wisdom. Serious about life. I'm not going through this carefree. Oh, well, let's watch this show. No big deal. Hold on. Walk circumspectly. Well, I'm going to listen to this. It's kind of harmless, I'm sure. Hold on. Satan wants to infect our hearts. Well, I'm gonna, this isn't a big deal, or oh, how about this? Or I'm not gonna be faithful. I'm not gonna hold on. Let's be serious about life. If we want to live like Christ, if we want to have a godly and a holy walk, how are we gonna do that? By walking in wisdom. So if we believe that, I think all of us would understand 
perhaps even agree we need to walk in wisdom. Here's my question. How do I get more of that? If I need wisdom, if I need to walk that way, I, I need to get more of it. My hand's up. I, I need, how do I get more wisdom? Well, here's three quick answers for you. First of all, th this is deep. You ready? Ask God for it. Hmm. That's our memory verse. If any of you lack wisdom, whoo, two hands up on that one. What's the answer? Let him ask of God. They give it to all men liberally and upbraid it not, and it shall be given him. If you and I lack wisdom, may I ask you, when's the last time you asked? They have not because we ask not. God wants to give you wisdom. And by the way, let me just veer off, exit here for just a moment. He won't give you more wisdom if you're not acting what, on what he's already given you. If you're not in his word and praying, if you're not searching it, if you're not doing your best to live for him, I'm not saying you're going to be perfect, but if you're not busy acting upon what he's already shown, he's not going to show you more. Why would he need to do that? Ask God for it. How else do we get wisdom? Here's the second one. Read and study his book of wisdom. If, if, if Sunday is the only time that you open the pages of your word, you're not going to have wisdom. I'm glad you're here. I'm not, I'm not uh, mad at you or against it. It's a good place for you to be. We need to be in church. Yeah. And yet that's not the only time we need to be in God's word. Right. It needs to be in us. Psalm 119, 130 says, The entrance of thy word giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. Read and study God's word. Ask God for it. How about this? Third of all, learn from those who have it. You understand we do that with everything else? If you if you got a car problem, if I got a car problem, there's one or two of you in here that I'm going to call. I know nothing about it, and I know you know a lot about it, so I need help. Mm -hmm. Right? We do that in life. How do I cook this? I better ask someone who knows how to cook this. How do I install this? Or we go to YouTube and find out. Right? How do I get wisdom? How about go to those who have it? Spend some time there. Paul told Timothy, he said, The thing thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Let's spread God's word. Why? We must walk in wisdom. And a, and a wise walk, first of all, is serious about life. That's verse 15. That leads us to our second and our final point, verse number 16. And it describes this. A wise walk, first of all, is serious about life. But a wise walk, second of all, hear me seizes the moment. A wise walk will seize the moment. Notice verse 16. The Bible says this. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Redeeming the time. You say, what in the world does redeeming the time mean? I think a lot of you know what redeeming the time means. Because I'll, I'll explain it this way. How many of you like shopping? Would you raise your hand? You all are so much more honest than our first crowd. I got to tell you, can I tell them the nine o'clock crowd for a moment? Yes. That'd be okay. When I asked that question, one person raised their hand. I said, y'all are just aren't listening. How many of you men, there's a lady in your house that likes shopping and like 15 hands went up. So the, the men were more honest. Shopping. What is shopping? Okay. More than shopping. How many of you like, and, and there'll be some men in this, in this one. How many of you like hunting for, for bargains on anything? Yeah, oh, that's, that's, that's my game right there. I enjoy that. Not just I'm going to get this, but I'm going to wait till this is at the cheapest price and, and compare all the airline tickets. You ever bought one of those? Yeah, there are times when they're real expensive and there are times where you get a good deal. And if you don't jump on it, you're going to miss it. Okay, how about this? How many of you like Costco? You're right here. This is my weak spot, can I just tell you? I, I don't go to Costco as much anymore because every time I go in there, I find some things that I didn't realize I needed. <laughs> I have to have that. And, and they have these deals and, you know, it's a, it's a buy only this week, $20 off. You better get it now. What, what is it? There's an opportunity to buy something and it's better opportunity now than any other time. Okay. We enjoy the shopping carts, but let's get back to the scripture. Redeeming the time. Scripture tells us you better take advantage of the opportunities that you have right now because it's not going to be around forever. Why? Why should we redeem the time? Why is it that important? The verse tells us because the days are evil. 
We don't live in, in a time where we always have an opportunity to make a difference. We don't always have an opportunity to share the gospel with someone. We need to redeem the time because the days are evil. The psalmist said it this way in Psalm 90 verse 12. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Do you see the correlation between numbering our days and wisdom? Between redeeming the time and walking in wisdom? May I ask you, how did you spend your days this past week? Were you redeeming the time? Were you using it on something that's going to outlast the day? Or outlast your life? You understand, you'll never get any second back. We say a lot of things in regards to time with good intentions, but the truth of the matter is they're not true at all. We've all said them. You ready for this? You understand you can't save time. I'm going to save time by doing that. No, you can't do that. You can't bottle up some time and save it and get it out later. Not possible. Some people say they're living on borrowed time. No, you can't borrow time either. I mean, we've all got the same amount of time, same amount of hours, the same amount of minutes, same amount of seconds in every day. Some people say, well, I'll get more time later. No, you won't. <laughs> You'll get the same amount of time that all of us have, now and later. A wise Christian then is going to redeem that time. That is something we can do with time. We can redeem it. We can buy up the opportunities. We can be busy sharing the gospel. May I ask you to consider when's the last time you told someone about Jesus? I'll go further. If it takes you a while to think about it, I think it's safe to say we're not redeeming the time. Mm -hmm. When's the last time we allowed the love of Christ to flow through us and we loved people? You know what's easy for us to do? I'll speak for myself. You know what's easy for me to do? Fly off the cuff when somebody makes me mad. That's what I can do. I'm not redeeming the time. I'm not seizing the moment. I can walk in the light and redeem the time. May I go the other direction? If I'm going to walk in wisdom and redeem the time, I'm not going to have time to pursue the things of the world. First John 2, 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's not what I said. That's what he said. I don't like that. I like to go after that. Take it up. Does God rule or not? Do we want to walk in wisdom or not? Did he say it or not? We've got to trust what he says and pursue things of God and not the things of the world. Why? I've got to redeem the times. The days are evil. I don't have time to live for myself. I don't have time to live for things that won't matter. I've got time to serve God. I got time to live for something that's going to outlast me. Mm -hmm. Romans 13, we looked at these verses last week, verses 11 and 12, that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Mm -hmm. You know what I hear all the time that I've even said? I just don't have time. Hmm. Not true. You do. We all do. The truth of the matter is, we're just not busy redeeming it. Instead, we're spending it on things that don't matter, yep. which is why we don't have time for things yep. to do. That's right. You have time for what you make time. Yep. Too many people allow what's pressing to control their time. What do you mean? We got that phone, and we got that call, or we got that notification that just came in, and all of a sudden, that is what's controlling my time. Or, or, or we got, ooh, we've got that TV show that we have to watch, or we've got this urgent pressing matter that just all of a sudden came up. And I'm, I'm not saying that it's never good and, and, and to, to, to take care of what's urgent, but if that's all we if that's all we allow our lives to be consumed with to redeem that time, we're not going to have time for what we should make time. All of us would agree we ought to take time and pray. All of us would agree we ought to take time and read the Bible, yet how many of us had time for it this week? I do, I do, I do. don't have time 
because we got this and we got that. Oh, may we make time. May we redeem the time. You know, I hear it often, especially in the summer. Hell, got a lot of things going on in the family. I don't want me in church much. Pastor, don't go there. Is God in charge? Does he love the church? Did he give his life for it? Yes. Okay, if he's in charge, am I going to walk as fools or as wise? There's no other way to do it. No other way to say it. I'm all for the family. I'm a big family man, for sure. Got to take time with our family. But if it's at the expense of taking time with God, it's not going to outlast us. And I'm, I'll say it this way. There's never a greater family time than with the Lord. It's not, it's not mutually exclusive. You can only have one or the other. I think you can combine the two. I think we can love the Lord and live for Him with our family. What, what are we saying? We're redeeming the time. We're walking wisely and seizing the moment. Why? Because the days are evil. A wise Christian remembers who's in charge and, and lives accordingly. A wise Christian understands there's only certain things I've got to redeem the time for. If I'm not, if, if I'm not busy doing that, I'm wasting our time. I've got to walk circumspectly. Not as fools, but as wise. I've got to redeem the time. And so let me give you, I give you a few thoughts of how to get more wisdom. Let me give you a few thoughts and we'll close with this on what are some wise uses of time. According to scripture, what are wise uses of time? May I say first and foremost, it would be the best use of your time this morning to get saved. 2 mm -hmm. Corinthians 6, 6 verse 2 says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 3.15 says, While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart, says the provocation. What, what are we saying? Right now, you can make a decision that will last forever. Consider that. What else can you do today that's going to make a difference for eternity? There's not many things, but one thing you can do is get your matter of eternity settled. Would you trust Jesus today? It's not a matter of, oh, I believe in him. I've always believed in him. No, no, no. It's a matter of turning from your sin. Understanding you can't get heaven on your own no matter how good you are. No matter how much you try. But he can give you heaven when you turn to him. That's why he went to the cross. And yet a lot of folks allow the circumstances that are going on in their life right now to cause them to put off this matter of eternity. I've heard it many times. Can I think about that? Yeah, I ask you, what's there to think about? It's heaven or hell. Well, uh, when I get around to it, I hope you do get around to it, but most of the time when folks say that, they never get around to it. Not a convenient time. He'll never let you down. Would you go over just a, a few books to the book of James? Mm -hmm. James chapter 4. Oh, we're talking about a wise use of our time. The, the, the best use of your time today is to be saved if you haven't been. Choose salvation to choose Christ. James 4 verse 13 tells us this. Go to, what's the next word? Now. I know you're not all there yet. Verse number 13, James 4. When you get there, go to, what's the next word? Now. Now. There's something to determine now. Go to now, ye that say. Okay, and it gives us a description of someone. Today or tomorrow we'll go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Do you see the haphazard attitude of this individual? Mm -hmm. Today, tomorrow, we'll go there, we'll do this, we'll do this for about a year, we'll, we'll do this, we'll do this, we've got plans, all good. That's wonderful. Until we get to verse 14 where it says, Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It's even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. Big difference between 13 and 14. The one in 13, carefree, I'm going to do this, do this, and maybe later on we'll do this. Verse 14, hold on, hold on. You're not even guaranteed tomorrow, buddy. Your life could be gone. So what do we do? Verse 15, for that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now you rejoice. Notice how it describes it in your boastings. 
All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him that is sin. May I plead with you this morning, if you're putting off whether or not you're going to trust Christ as Savior, don't put it off anymore. If you know to do good and do it not to him that is sin, there's nothing that's worth an eternity in hell just to be comfortable here in life. Amen. Trust him today. Turn to him today. The best use of your time is to be saved. Let me give you a second one. You know what else is a wise use of our time? Be saved. Second of all, serve the Lord. Just determine. I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to live for something that outlasts me. Ecclesiastes 9.10, Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. Why? For there is no device, nor work, there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. That's not exactly the most encouraging thought at the end. Um, you're all going to the grave, big, big guy. All of you. And you can't do nothing there. So whatever you're going to do, do it now. Serve the Lord now. I'm so grateful that he's given us in this time, in this age, he's given us his church to allow us opportunities. How else am I going to serve the Lord if it's apart from his church? Uh, he's given us opportunities in his church. Are we busy redeeming the time serving him? 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be a steadfast, unmovable, hear this, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Why? For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. What does that mean? My labor is in vain when it's not in the Lord. My work and my, my device and all the time and labor I spend, if it's not in the Lord... It's in vain. I don't want it to be in vain. I want to serve the Lord. Let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. There's joy, can I tell you, in serving Jesus. Yeah. Can I tell you the most joyful people here today? The ones who've been busy serving Jesus. Amen. The joy of the Lord is your strength. I can tell you some miserable people here today. Those that are wondering if i got time to be in or out on this thing. I meet with and talk to and, and deal with miserable people all the time. There's no time to wonder anymore, am I going to live for Jesus? Redeem the time. The days are evil. There's no time to wonder, am I going to serve Him or not? Redeem the time. The days are evil. There's no time today to wonder, am I just going to give up on church altogether? This person hurt me. This person got All those things are real, but there's no time to wonder if I'm going to give up on Jesus, if I'm going to give up on church, if I'm going to give up on people. No, we got to redeem the time because the days are evil. There's no time to wonder, am I going to give to God's work? Redeem the time. The days are evil. There's no time to wonder, am I going to be all in in this thing or not? Redeem the time. Because the days are evil. How can we make use of our time? Be safe. How can we make the best use of our time? Serve the Lord. I'll give you this one finally. How about the special opportunities we have to make a difference? You know, each one of us has special opportunities to make a difference. Would you go to John chapter 4? The last place I'll have you turn. We'll close with this. Every one of us have an opportunity to make a difference. I'm talking about something, again, that's going to outlast you. Something that's bigger than you. In John chapter 4, it's a familiar story of the woman at the well. But here's what happens. The disciples and Jesus are coming into Samaria. And they go up to a well. And Jesus says, guys, go on into the city. I'm hungry. Let's go get some food. Bring it back. I'm going to stay here. I'm going to wait on you guys. While they go, a woman comes. Jesus witnesses to her. She, she realizes he's the Messiah. Her life has changed. She goes back into the city telling everybody about Jesus. And the disciples come back to Jesus. And we pick it up in verse 31. It says this. It's kind of funny. In the meanwhile, his disciples prayed him saying, Master, eat. So, so they got food. You were hungry. All right. Here you go. Eat. Verse 32. But he said to them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore, it said the disciples one to another. Has any man brought him out to eat? Do what's happening? Oh, Jesus, just a little while ago you were hungry. That's why we went in the city. And here's your food. And you're saying you got meat. Who else brought you some food while we were gone? And he says this in verse 34. Don't miss him. Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Jesus, disciples, let me teach you something. I am so consumed 
with what God has given me. And while you were gone, I told this lady all about it. Why? Because that's what he's told me to do. And I'm so consumed with finding what he has for me and then doing it. I've got to finish his work. I've got to find it. I've got to follow it. I've got to fulfill it. I've got to finish his work. I'm consumed with that, disciples. And then he says this, verse 35. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. Now, hold on, hold on. We're up on top of this hill at the well. They can look and see. He's telling them, hey, guys. Look around. Look at these fields. Go ahead. Lift your head up. Stop looking at me. Look around. Look at the fields. Look on the fields. It says, for they are white already to harvest. Disciples, you think you got time. Three or four months and then harvest time. And then we'll, we'll begin to work and bring it in the, the sheaves and the grain. But hold on. Look around. Hey, guys, look around. Right now, it's ready. He's telling the disciples, I've got work to do. I've got to follow what God says. I've got to do what he says. And I've got to do it right now. It's not a matter of when I get around to it. It's not a matter of when it's convenient. It's not a matter of when it falls on the calendar properly. I've got a work to do in people's lives right now. Christian, may I tell you, you've got an opportunity right now to make a difference in someone's life. It's not when it's convenient. It's not when it fits in your schedule. It, it's not here. It's right now, Jesus said. Are you making a difference? Don't miss it. Too many of us are so busy with our schedule, with our world, with our things to do, with our calendar, that we're missing the opportunities that are right in front of our faces. And Jesus said, lift up your eyes. What's he saying? Get out of your world. Get into mine. Get out of your business and follow his business. And if some have compassion making a difference, God's put people in your life. God will put people in your path this week that you can make a difference in. It's not up to you whether they're going to accept it. It's not up to you with how they respond to it. It is up to you if we're going to give it. Are you going to share that gospel? Are you going to show the love of Christ? How about the person in your row this morning? If I were to ask you, how many of you have some needs in your life? You know what I dare say? Every hand would be up. You know what that means? There's other people that need your prayer. You can make a difference and pray for someone. When's the last time you just stopped someone and prayed with them right then? We're good at saying, I'll pray for that. How about pray with them right now? Some have compassion making it. You have not because you ask not. May I just tell you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. They're wide already to harvest. Well, we do our best here, even, even as a church. Every month we have some kind of push, some kind of outreach. Why is that? There's a lot of different reasons why we have that. But you know one of the biggest one is? To give us opportunities to make a difference in someone else's life. You know why I, I, it's kind of crazy sometimes I have you raise your hand. How many of you want 10 of these invitations? Why? I'm just trying to give you avenues to make a difference. Just trying to, hey, let's get outside of our world. Why do we have sometimes a, a, a time of visitation on Saturday? That's so inconvenient. That's the event. I understand. To be honest, most of the time it's inconvenient for me. And I'm a preacher for crying out loud, right? I, I got this to do and this to do, but we need to lift up our eyes and look on the fields. Why? They're right, right already the harvest. You know what happens almost every month without fail? I get those invitations out. There's a family that comes in. I had no idea this church existed. I, I've been needing help. I'm looking for an answer. I've been encouraged. There are folks in here right now that came months and months ago because they got a car. What is this? We're just doing our best to make a difference right now. Why? Because a wise walk seizes the moment, redeems the time. Do you understand the days are evil? We all get that. That means the days are filled with sorrow and sickness and, and pain and death. Oh, we have an opportunity right now. Maybe not wait. Maybe give of ourselves. We don't know how much time we have left. But we know we have this moment. And Jesus said, Fields are white, already to harvest, opportunities around us. So let's walk wisely. 
If we're going to be like Christ, if we're going to have a godly walk and a holy walk and walk in the light, that means we've got to walk in wisdom. That means today I'm going to walk circumspectly. Not paranoid, but I'm going to make sure each step is wise. That Satan's not implanting some infection of sin in my heart. I'm not going to walk as fools. I'm going to let God control. I'm going to walk as wise. So I'm going to be serious about life, but I'm going to seize the moment. I'm going to redeem the time. If I don't, I miss it. I miss that opportunity. What? The days are evil. Walk in wisdom. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Let's walk in wisdom. Let's bow our heads and hearts together in prayer this morning. Thank you for listening.